We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from fan Danielle Thomas, better known to fans of the show as Major Kayla. Danielle asks, what are your suggestions for games that are good to play in a pub? Games that are easy to grab, easy to set up, quick to play, and don't piss off the staff. <laughs> nice. Now, Danielle had a little more about what games are good while drinking. And while we touched on this, it could be another show topic completely. Yeah, I think I'd like to do another list on that, though it does kind of encourage drinking a lot. And I don't like to encourage drinking too much. But thank you, Danielle, for the great topic suggestion and for your longtime support of our show. Now, before we get to our list of great games for a pub crawl, let's take a hint from Danielle's question and talk a bit about what makes for a good bar game. I also think there's a note that I want to mention right here is that we are the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast. So we're looking at tabletop games to play at a pub, not pub games. Like when you say pub games to certain people, you say pub games to me. I think of the games we're talking tonight, but you say them to my dad even. And he's thinking dart, shuffleboard, pool, billiards, or uh, folded paper football, 20 questions, pub trivia. All the games have been played in bars and pubs for years now. Also, we understand pubs and other locales for imbibing adult beverages aren't for everyone. Yeah. We are tonight, however, focusing on that sort of venue specifically, which tend to have different vibes, benefits, and potential problems from other venues like coffee houses or restaurants. Yep. While we are not endorsing alcoholic beverages. We do partake ourselves, though understand this episode might not fit in your needs or interests, and we won't be upset if you skip to the reviews later. Yeah, while the reviews might be good drinking games or games to play while drinking, they don't require it in any way, and they're just as good at a coffee shop or at your own game table. So what makes for a good tabletop game to bring to a pub? Let's start with one that Danielle already called out, and honestly, it's one of the best things, and I love that she called it out, and that is that people don't always think about it, and it is pissing off the staff. When playing in any public place, you want to avoid things like overly loud games, games that take up a lot of room. If you have to move tables, that's pretty much a no-no. And you also don't want to take up extra room just for the game. Putting drinks on another table might work for game night, but you don't want to take up a table that could have other patrons at it during a bar night. Dice can also be a problem. While most of us gamers love the clattering of dice, they can be quite loud and disruptive if you're not the one playing with the dice. Maybe bring a padded dice tray to help with this. Even just playing games might not be accepted at some places. Some pubs want tables to flip. They want people to come in, get a round or two, and get out so the next group can come in and get their own couple of rounds. They don't want someone sitting there playing board games for six or more hours. Now, this is going to depend a lot on the venue, and you're going to have to make a judgment call based on your establishment of choice and always err on the side of caution and say, hey, is it cool if we set up a game here? Now, we covered a lot of this stuff back on episode 12. The next round is on you and the do's and don'ts of tabletop gaming at cafes and pubs article on the blob. But that was back in 2018. So some of this bears repeating. That was a long time ago. I, I somewhat kind of want to beg you not to watch <laughs> episode 12. So, man, we were, we, we, uh, we, there were a lot less of us back then. I put that video on. I'm like, man, a lot less gray too. Uh, uh, and a lot less audio quality. <laughs> now, Danielle said the staff don't piss off the staff, but you also don't want to piss off other patrons. Uh, be sure you're not taking up too much space, like physically, like you're standing up, you're getting excited or getting into other people's personal space. Now, like, for example, of a game that, that you may not realize is not a great pub game is Pitch Car. It sounds great. I brought it to pubs until I realized that Pitch Car, everyone's moving around the table and having to get the right angle and leaning in like they're about to take a pool shot and sticking their butts in the people sitting next to us. I realized I'm like, OK, well, this was fun tonight. I'm not going to bring this one out again on a pro game night where I can say, hey, can we reserve some tables over in the corner? Maybe, but not just on an average night that's filled with your average patrons as well as you playing games. Again, we are assuming here that you haven't set up a game night at a pub. You're right. just out for drinks with some friends in and amongst the rest of the regular patrons. Now, the other thing they mentioned is easy to grab games. You want portable games. 
For one, they take up less space, which we already mentioned something is to consider. They take up less space on the table. Um, They're also easier to carry, but more importantly, there's less packaging or box you have to find a spot for. This is something that I sometimes make this mistake. I, I forget about the fact that the box, the what everything comes in, or the board game backpack I brought, or my Metro carrying bag full of games also needs room. I tend to bring pretty small footprint games, but sometimes those pretty small footprint games, including one we're going to mention tonight, happens to have a bigger than needed box. Well, the game fits great on the table, and I now have a box that I have nowhere to put. If there are less than four of you, you might have an extra chair you can use yeah. to store a box, but don't count on it. And if there's only two of you, you can't be sure you'll get a four top to play at. And I would recommend if there are only two of you and there's a choice between a two and a four table, don't steal the four table because you plan on playing games. It, well, unless the place is completely empty and you're not expecting it to fill in, but you want uh, the bar wants those seats filled, whether it's with gamers or not. Please don't take up more room than you need. Now, a trick that I actually learned from Danielle and Owen, which I think is, is appropriate since it was their question tonight, is reboxing your games. This can really help with the big box, not much stuff issue. Uh, they, in particular, showed me two photo cases. One of those things where it's, I don't know, plastic and you snap it together and inside are all these little tiny boxes. And they had RPGs in there. They had uh, various different card games. They even had full board games. It's amazing how little space some of your games take if you just cut them down to the bare minimum. So I strongly recommend if you are going to be playing out and about at bars, pubs, cafes, also at restaurants and so on, rebox your games. Put them into something smaller and more portable that's really easy to just put the nice plastic, easy to clean case on the bar floor while you're playing the game on the table. Now, another reason to consider reboxing is not showing up looking like someone who might annoy your son, the <laughs> staff. Even just looking like someone who might hog a table and not spend much money could be a yeah. negative. So walking in with a big old board game box could set off some red flags with staff. Next, quick to play. That's pretty much a given, right? Pubs aren't really the spot for that five hour euro. Another thing, though, is quicker games are easier to stop. You finish game rounds more often. I've often found on longer bar game nights that after the first round of games and after the first round of drinks, people are a little less interested on in continuing. Sometimes it's the third round. Sometimes it's the fifth round of a game that they're like, I've had enough. Now, with short games, it's way easier for people to step out between rounds or to just say, you know what, let's call it a night and put the game away instead of, well, yeah, you know, I've kind of had enough and I'm having a hard time thinking and I wish we were playing something lighter, but there's still seven rounds to go in this game. You don't want to be in that position where if you're playing 10, 15 minutes, half an hour at the most games, it's really easy to go, OK, that's it for this round. Who wants in for the next round? Or, hey, let's grab something else. Or, you know what, let's just uh, let's order some food and sit and chat for a bit. Maybe we'll pick the games up later. Now, also, games that are quick to play are generally more amicable to social interaction. Yeah. There's probably a reason you're out at a bar and not at someone's <laughs> home, and part of that is probably social. Everyone sitting, staring, focused on the next action and ignoring everyone else around them may not be the ideal pub situation. Now, I would also add you want quick-to-learn games because quick games aren't necessarily quick-to-learn. Sitting at a brewery with a tasting flight in front of you is not the time to try to explain to a group of players how to play Brew Crafters, the board game, despite the fact it may be highly thematic at the time. That's a pretty heavy euro that no one wants to sit through a teach of that lasts longer than your drinks. Plus, the more people drink, the less able they're going to be to learn something new. And familiarity is kind of the key. You want to play familiar, well-known, or at least easy to teach games. Now, while your personal mileage may vary, and we always encourage responsible drinking, inebriation is going to impact, impact gameplay. That's yeah. just how it works. Now, one not on Danielle's list, and this is for the person bringing the games, is make sure to bring games that are cheap, easy to replace, or easy to clean, or all of the above. One of the things you have to be concerned with, but don't want to be worried about all night saying, no, don't, don't, don't do that is potential spills from drinks and other grease and grime from food and, well, grease and grime from being in a bar. Don't bring your $300 deluxified foil card uber rare out of print signed by the designer game to the pub. 
do bring a $10 card game that's already been played 50 times and looks a little grimy, but you can replace it for another 10 bucks. And if someone happens to step on a card on the floor and or you play it on a table where you can't pick it up because the table's so sticky, um, you just go buy another copy. Do bring games that are easy to clean. Less cards, more tiles. Less cardboard, more neoprene, and so on. A perfect example is a recent night we had at a pub where the tables were sticky. Nasty sticky. Yeah. You can't assume you're going to be able to ask for a different table. And the problem wasn't even actually a type of dirt, but the type of coating they put on the wood. Yeah, someone varnished this table with the wrong kind of varnish, and I think it'll be forever tacky. Uh, this was bad. We, we basically ruined a card playing the game and then put placemats down and played on top of those. So, yeah. So, of course, what goes along with this, and the chat's already calling it out as well, good call, Ryan. A side note, protect your games, especially those you're going to bring out to a pub. For tips on this, check out episode 208 of our podcast named Damage Control. Now, at the most basic, here's where I do and would suggest actually sleeving your cards. Play mats or even just some paper can help, too. We solved our sticky table problem by using the menus to put our <laughs> cards down on. Another one you may want to do. Now, this one, this one's going to vary depending on you and your group, but higher player count games. You never know when someone might show up that you weren't expecting, or you might be open to letting strangers into your game. Now, this may be a me thing mainly, but sometimes I run into other fellow gamers I know, or when I'm out for a pint, or we're sitting on the patio and someone walks by and I'm like, hey, come on, join us. Also, there's other times we're playing someone and someone comes over like, oh, what are you playing? That looks really cool. And we're like, hey, sit down. Well, I'll teach you to play this. I'm the tabletop bellhop. How's it going? You're going to love this game. So I like bringing games with higher play counts. Even if it's just two of us, I'll make sure I have a four player game with me just in case. Now, this is definitely a hit or miss thing. And depending on you and your friend group, make sure everyone you're with is going to be OK mm. with others joining in. And you're not turning something everyone else thought of as a couple's night out into an event. Now, another one I actually recommend you bring are a confrontational player versus player take that style of games. I've found over many years of hosting public play events that these tend to do better at our bar drinking game nights than, say, cooperative games. This is just, a, I think it goes with the alcohol or the, the loss of inhibitions, but people who indulge in a few drinks seem to really enjoy messing with other players, screwing other players over, and also care a little bit more about winning, even if the game isn't so serious. Now, on the other hand, I've noticed people drinking tend to get a little more frustrated with the other players in a cooperative experience than they probably would at home. Now, a night at a pub is when games like Munchkin and Flux will actually get played. And when I'll leave games like Pandemic at home, even if all the players coming out that night know how to play it very well. This could also go hand in hand with the complexity. Co-op games often have aspects that require a little more thinking and planning combos between players or figuring out if what you will do will benefit the next player and so on. Now, Ryan in our chat just called out, by that measure, Uno sounds like a solid pub game night option. And I agree. Uno is a great choice. We didn't toss it on our list tonight. It's it's not really a hobby game, though. We didn't stick to all hobby games anyway. I would recommend Uno. That's, that's a good one. Like, Uno is the game that if I owned a pub would be there for people to play, like Connect 4 and Uno. And, and again, it also fits the familiar. It fits the small footprint. It works. Uno is a good one. Just make sure you play by the real rules. Ah, who cares? And I, <laughs> actually, I think of pub nights when you let someone stack four, pick up fours on top of each other. No Monopoly, though. <laughs> Not all mass market games are good for pubs. All right, Sean mentioned this uh, a bit earlier, but I'm, I'm just going to call back to it, is you want social games. I We assume that the reason you're going to a pub is because you want to be out and about with other people, and you want games where you can socialize and chat and hang out and catch up and get distracted and talk about whatever the latest thing you had on TV. So this goes with the lighter and quicker thing mentioned earlier, but even some light quick games take a lot of focus and that's not what you want. You don't want any game 
where everyone's focused on the game so that all they're worried about is who wins the game and making their next move and planning. That's just not the game you want for a social pub night. You want the game where you're like, ah, ha, ha, how's it going? Yeah, okay, it's my turn. Sure, um, I'll play this one and see what happens. Okay, let's get back to our conversation about the latest sports ball game. You also don't want games that prohibit talking. Well, the mind may seem like a perfect pub game, Unless your pub has a vow of silence, it's really not. Indeed, as I spoke of earlier, the game should be a social lubricant, not a stop sign. For now, mm-hmm. though, let's get on with some game recommendations. All right, so the first game that popped into my head uh, that when, when I read this question on our thing, and probably when Daniel asked the question originally on our Twitch stream, is Skull. And the main reason is this is a bar game originally, like going back to Skittles and some of the games people played at bars. This was a game created by bikers played with coasters originally. So it just makes sense to play the game that originated by bikers playing in a bar and drinking to play at a bar while drinking. So Skull is kind of a light social deduction game in in the way that poker can be kind of social deduction because you're trying to read the other players combined with a bit of push your luck, right? The, The whole thing here is you're using your bravado to brag how many coasters you can flip over without revealing a skull. And then the next person can upbid you. And then they have to tell people to reveal their, their coasters. And if a skull comes up, uh, they lose. And if the skull doesn't come up, they win. And if you win twice, you win the whole game. And if you lose three or four times, I don't even remember you're out of the game and there's a little bit more to it, but that's basically it. It is. It started as a drinking game. I'm sure you didn't have points in the original. I'm sure it was pound your drink or something like that. One of the best things about Skull is it literally can play any number of players as long as you have the components for it. And for years, there were two publishers that published this game, and one published Skull and one published a game called Roses. And they got together and put out a set called Skull and Roses, the double the player count. But unfortunately, the Roses half seems to be gone now, and all you can get is Skull. But really, you can make your own copy with beer coasters or whatever. You just need three of one kind and one that's different. And the one that's different, try to find something with some kind of skull on it because that makes it very obvious. Can you bring a kid's game to a bar night? Absolutely. Kids Mm -hmm. dexterity games are often perfect for a night at the pub as they often have small footprints, are portable, have super easy to pick up rules and themes and actually get more challenging later (laughs) in the night. Now for this, we called out Go Cuckoo, as it's one of our favorites, but you could very easily put others here. Just make sure you're watching out for small parts or things potentially rolling away. Next, I said, don't bring the mind, but from Pandasaurus, do bring the game. This is the game. The game is the game in my collection that gets played the most often at pubs, uh, both two player with just Deanna and I when we're out for a double date night with Tori and Kat, when we're out at chapter two and someone's walking by the patio and we're like, hey, come join us and play a game. This is a single deck of cards, uh, numbered two to 99, and then um, some little marking cards to show if you're counting up or down. You're trying to play the cards in order. It sounds really simple, but that, that's it. That's the basics is you get a hand of cards and you're trying to play them in order. I Everyone picks it up right away, but it's highly engaging. And it does the whole, the more you drink, the harder it is to play thing, which I find usually works pretty well, especially once you get to that point where everyone's in that, that, um, there's a term Deanna uses. I don't want to throw in here when you're floaty and you're like, wait, why did you do that? You knew it should have been this. And remember I had an eight and you laugh about it instead of being angry about it. Next, I have brew crafters, the travel card game which seems to have been renamed Microbrewers. And I don't know if Microbrewers has the travel card game after it. Um, this is from the same company that did um, did uh, Brew Crafters. And I completely forget the name of the company. So sorry, we're not calling out companies as much. If, if I think of them, I'll mention them. Uh, this is an obvious choice when you're going to a brewery, right? Like I actually have a goal to play Brew Crafters, the travel card game, and as many brewers as I can. Now, this is a step above most mass market games. So this isn't necessarily the one to bring when you're going to hang out with your drinking buddies who aren't normally gamers, but it's something that is definitely pretty light for a hobby board game for people who are used to playing more difficult games. 
Uh, this is a tableau building engine building card game that is about brewing beer and highly thematic in it about collecting the right resources and hiring people for your brewery and improving your brewery. It's it's actually a really neat game that does a good job of capturing the the beer making elements that is small, portable, fits in a back pocket, simple card game. And Brewcrafters, the travel card game, a.k.a. Microbrewers, is by Greater Than Games, uh, among Thank other you. publishers. Uh, originally self-published, actually. Uh, so next up, we have, well, a pack of cards. I mean, okay, yes. it's not the hobby board game suggestion you're probably looking for, but come on. People have been playing cards in pubs for decades or centuries, mm -hmm. possibly. There is <laughs> nothing saying you have to break that tradition. Whether it's hearts and spades or 31 for higher player counts, there are so many options with this classic go-to. Okay, hobby gamers, you don't want to play traditional card games. You're beyond them or whatever your problem was with them. Uh, let's go to then a modern trick-taking game. And I'm going to call out of the ones we've been playing recently is Thrones of Valeria. Uh, mainly because it plays three to six players. With an even number of players, you're playing teams. If you're playing on odd number, you're just playing uh, pl everyone plays on their own. Uh, last person standing, basically, or, or highest points wins, I guess. Uh, this is one of the best modern trick-taking games we've played and has been a huge hit with a large number of gamers. This is one of the ones that I have been taking out to the barbershop bar. We had a great time with it ourselves, playing it with Sean, playing it with Tori and Kat, playing it with the extended family. Once I got it out to the public, it was an even bigger hit. Now, this has the advantage of only having two rounds. You only play through two hands, so it doesn't take all night. Plus, to Sean's chagrin, they already look kind of grimy because of the art on the cards, so you don't have to worry too much about marking these up. Now, another dexterity game, but one that doesn't rely on the player's ability to stack things is Drop It. This mm -hmm. could be a better fit, especially later in the night. Now, we love this Tetris-like game of dropping different shapes and colors of blocks. And I would say that this is the most popular game out of everything we have ever brought to mm -hmm. the barbershop bar since we started there uh, as a public event. Jumping back to mass market games you can pretty much get anywhere, I have to recommend Racco, which Dan and I rediscovered uh, due to a brewery, the Bandit Goose Brewery in Kingsville. This was on the shelf one night. We were there having pints, and I thought it'd be funny to grab it, and then ended up, I'm like, Dan has never played Racco. So we sat down, I taught her to play Racco, and she loved it as much as I did. Remember, Dan is the heavy gamer out of our group, too. But this one is just super casual, and it is awesome for that, you're barely playing a game while hanging out and chatting. You're just chatting, laughing, hanging out, listening to the music, clapping to the band and looking, going, hey, OK, I'll put my three here and throw that 37 out. Oh, they picked it up. Oh, well, OK, yeah, yeah, OK, OK. What am I going to play next? Now nah, I don't have any good in my hand. I'll draw. Right. It's just so simple. The only problem I have with Racco for a pub night is it only plays four players. Now, speaking of low player counts. Let's say it is a couple's night and you're not expecting to hang out with anyone else. So you don't want to invite anyone else to the table. One of the classic bar night games for hobby gamers is Hive. It's a great two player abstract game that has the huge advantage of having almost invulnerable tiles that are impervious to dirt and pretty much impossible to damage. This is one Dan and I used to play a lot. We used to bring Hive everywhere. Um, we have the full version, not the pocket version. The pocket version, I think, would be even better. Um, it's a Bakelite tiles. It's in a, like, what, what's that? I don't think it's a waterproof bag, but, like, it's in a sealed bag. Um, just take the instructions out, and you can probably dunk this thing in the water. And, heck, on Board Game Geek, I've seen people play it at the bottom of a pool. We played this a ton until the next game on this list came out. The next one being The Duke. Now, the Duke has a lot going for it. It's the most chess-like abstract game that's not actually chess, and in my opinion, way more fun. And we've yeah. mentioned this one a lot, but it has been some time. So the thing is, you need to catch the opponent's Duke. Each piece shows how it moves on the piece, with the neat bit being that you flip them over after you move to a different way of moving on the other side of that piece. 
And yep. the only real disadvantage is it is a two player only game. And we noticed that it's a little hard to get at the moment, but it is still being published. Sticking with two player only abstract games, I'm going to bring up Shobu. This, like Hive and, uh, uh, and the Dude to some part, the Dude does have a board. So more like Hive, this one's great for not having to really worry about spills. The components in this game are a silk rope, some wooden boards, and some stones, like literal stones. Uh, it's a really simple grid-based movement where you're going to make a passive move, then make a matching aggressive move, which can push opponent's pieces on the opposite colored board with the goal of knocking off all the opponent's pieces on one of the four boards. It is a really solid abstract strategy game that's super easy to learn, but man, is there a lot of depth and strategy here. Now stick around as we'll be doing a deep dive into Shobu later in the show. Next up, Telestrations, particularly the 12 player party pack. This is one of our all time favorite party games, but there is one concern here and that is your group getting to be a bit too loud. Yeah. Now, if that's not a problem where you are, go for it. If there's a band playing, they won't hear you. This is yep. a formalized version of Eat Poop You Cat or the telephone game, but with drawings. You draw something, pass your book, that person looks at your drawing and writes what they saw. That then gets passed and the next person draws based on what is written out and back and forth and so on and so on. As for scoring, does anyone actually keep score for this game? Uh, no, thanks. Oh, wait, no, that's the next <laughs> game. Sorry. Uh, no, thanks. We're going to we're, we're moving into higher player count games here. I think uh, we are going to have a bunch of those to wrap up here. So the first high player count game, higher player count game though we mentioned one earlier is no thanks. Uh, this is super simple to teach plays pretty quick. Um, it's also great for getting people chatting during play. And I found this one that once people have a couple drinks, it starts to get a little more competitive and trash talk is pretty common as is egging people on. Come on, spend the chip. You can do it. You can do it or take the card. You'll be fine. You know, the 14 still out there. That kind of talk I see a lot in um, later in the night games of no thanks at bar game nights. Now, if somehow you don't know this game, you get past a card and you either put a chip on it and pass it on or take it. Your score at the end of the game is all the cards you took minus your chips that you have left. The twist is you only score the lowest card in a run and the lowest score wins. That's pretty much no thanks. Next, I have the Great Del Moody, which for some reason is just making me think of how many games on this list are older games that we've talked about a lot over the last five years. But anyway, the Great Del Moody for years was my favorite high player count ladder based card game. This is the game that I play with my aunts and uncles and at one time my grandmother. When she was still around, this is my casual gamers. Um, it, let's play something a little better than something with a deck of cards. I would break this one out. Now, the goal of this game is to void your hand. The deck here is 13 different suits where you have 13, 13s, 12, 12s, 11, 11s, and so on, all the way down to the great Del Moody, which is the one. Each hand starts with a set of matching cards. The next player has to play the same number of cards, but a lower number. Now, the whole thing is, if you can't do it, the person before you wins the trick and gets the leap. First one to empty their hand becomes the Great Dal Moody. Last person to enter their hand becomes the Greater Peon. And there's some fun rules in there for what the Dal Moody can do, what you can make the Peon do. Players in the middle are merchants that can trade and so on. I have been playing this game at pub game nights for years. Well, there we go. Next up, we're going to finish off with a final high player count game which is, believe it or not from us, a social deduction game yep. for up to 11 players where you aren't forced to lie. This is Psychobabble. Now, this features a hidden trader-style role still, but even the trader doesn't know for certain they are a trader until the end. Mm -hmm. One of the best things about this game is the artwork. This one, you can expect other tables are going to be like, what are you playing? And if you stick around, we'll have more info on Psycho Babble as that's our other review tonight. So those were our suggestions. Games I would, and in most cases, have actually brought out to a pub, bar, or brewery to play. Now, leading up to this episode, we asked our fans what games they think are great to bring to the pub. And here's what they came up with. Jaipur, a solid two-player game. That's a maybe due to requiring a bit of focus, so you lose out a bit on the social aspect. It 
could have been on the list if we didn't limit it to 15. Hanabi. Yeah, I can see it. And when I did a little Googling to see if there were any games I forgot and other people's lists of top bar games and geek lists with bar games, everyone mentioned Hanabi. But to me, this one gets into that too much concentration level. The You have to be focused on the game. You have to be paying attention if you want to play Hanabi. You're watching whether players' cards are. You're look, looking for their, their um, what's the word, the, the tells. You're looking for their tells. You're looking for those subtle hints on what cards to play. And to me, that's just a better one for playing, you know, when you're caffeinated and on some coffee, maybe, instead of having some drinks. I think you take Hanabi too seriously, honestly. I, I've never won a game of Hanabi, and I Everyone still have fun I played playing with it. it. No, everyone I played Hanabi with takes it too seriously, though. I don't even own it because I don't like it because it's you can't talk and people are get mad when you make the wrong move and when you discard a card and then people throw their cards across the table and flip the table. And Hanabi's a super competitive, nasty people game. I don't know. <laughs> that's not just one group. That's that's I, I everyone I played Hanabi with is like that. Uh, next one, Tinderbox. I have been seeing this a lot. Um, it is a gram-worthy game. People sure like posting reels and TikToks of playing Tinderbox. This, I, I want a copy of this one. Now, it's one of those mint tin size boxes, so totally wins on the uh, no table space, no, no, no. You want to know where to put the box, you put it in your breast pocket, right? So it, it's a dexterity game about building a tiny fire with stacks of wood, charcoal, and little flame cubes and stuff. It looks great. Um, I, I haven't actually read the rules, but I'm assuming you just keep playing until someone knocks it over. Maybe it's like, uh, it could be like the, oh, there's one we could have had on the list, but it's a kid's dexterity game. So we did kind of did. Kind of like Rhino Hero, where maybe you're using cards. I don't know. I haven't actually played it, but I got to say, it's it's on my wish list. A Tinderbox looks like a perfect game for that, at least for most bar nights, not with Deanna. Deanna does not like dexterity games. She would not like Tinderbox. So uh, your favorite version of Low Letter. Yeah, we can see this. And while, while we're not huge fans, that's one place where we will play this series of games. Yeah, if you're like, uh, let's have some pints, I'm going to bring us some love letter. I'll be like, okay, remind me how to play this particular version. I'll go for it. Uh, Cockroach Poker. I saw multiple people recommend this. I saw people tonight in our chat room. We're bringing this one up as well. I, I feel bad. I never played this. I, I don't even know how to play. I have no idea what it's about. I I. I don't know. I don't know what cockroach poker is. I, I can recognize the box. Someone's going to have to teach me what cockroach poker is so I can see if it belongs on this list. Never played it. If anyone has it, bring it Saturday to the barbershop bar. Speaking of other games that I've never played is Picomino or Picomino. I think it's Picomino like Domino, but I'm not positive. I hadn't heard of this one. Um, no cardboard, small, portable. It's dice and tiles. The tiles kind of look like dominoes, but they're not. Uh, age eight up, which sounds about right for drinking adults. So next up point salad. This one is great and, and really should have probably been on the list. I love this yeah. one. I love it at bars. I've played it drinking. It's been played at bars and breweries. Uh, this is a fantastic choice. Thanks tech for mentioning that one, mentioning that one in the discord. We fully endorse that. Yeah, that was the one I saw and I was like, oh, do I take no thanks off our list and put that there instead? <laughs> Um, next one we have uh, from the fans is Pandemic the Cure. Uh, yeah, this is a better choice than Pandemic. Um, this is the dice version where you're rapidly rolling dice, and it does some nice stuff for corralling the dice where it gives you like these rings that they, they stay in. So I like that. Do watch that dice rolling sound. It can be very annoying if you're, you know, trying to watch the game at another table and enjoy your drinks and you keep hearing the clattering. So that'll depend on the venue you're at. Um, I enjoyed Cure the time I played it, but as I've noted on other recent shows in the last year, I'm just not at all interested in playing anything called Pandemic. Um, after the last three years, I'm I'm done with Pandemics uh, and always possible. And our last one on the list um, that we had ahead of time here is Quix. Uh, this is a very popular, pretty much mass market roll and write. I say pretty much because I tend to see this one in educational toy stores than say Toys R Us. But it's out there at some of the big box stores as well. I've never tried this one, but we do know our own personal paladin loves this, strongly recommends it. Um, also a great game to play while waiting for your food at a restaurant, I've been told. Well, that's it for our talk about games to bring to a pub, bar, or brewery. What is a game you pack when heading out for a pint? Was it on our list? 
If not, be sure to tell us about it in the comments. Have a question for us? Hit us up with an email. Questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Head over to the blog, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop.